Hello, and welcome to News Now on News Centro TV. I am Judith uh, TV. The top stories at this hour. Nigerians lose millions as many shops burnt with unquantifiable goods destroyed. Africa faces rising natural disasters as El Nino threatens. Court upholds life sentence for Burundi XPM Buyoni. Details shortly. We begin the news of this hour by giving you an update on a devastating fire outbreak that struck the Karo market in the Federal Capital Territory late Thursday night, leaving a trail of destruction and loss. Goods and properties worth millions of Naira have been reduced to ashes, leaving traders and shoppers in a state of despair. The cause of the fire is still under investigation and officials are working to determine the exact circumstances surrounding the outbreak. Some traders who spoke to News Central said they had lost all their livelihoods. Take a look. Rest for the day, so I went home. Uh, uh, so I was called at uh, a fire was, uh, you know, it was in the market, so I had to, to rush down here. Again, I get it to, to the market. You know, everything, and the fire has raised everything. Uh, there was, as, in, as you can see for yourself, there, there's nothing. There's nothing left in the market. There's nothing left in the market. I think the, the market is completely raised out. So I need to appeal to the government to come to our aid. Actually, I don't have the full information. I don't know actually what happened, but I was called this evening that the whole market is on fire, and unfortunately, I came. Even my own shop was burned down. Wow, well, what what were you selling? I deal with food stores and uh, food items, condiments, uh, bags of rice, bags of curry, bags of food uh, stores. As you are now, what is the feeling like? It's very bitter. Very bitter and very sad. I just feel like someone could help me out and help my fellow traders in the country. Because it's very bitter. There are those who, these places, there's are supposed to living on daily basis. And seeing that this thing has happened, some even collapsed, some just fell, uh, 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 some took into to hypertension, some just feel like the whole world has ended. So we are, we are, we are pleading to the government, to the federal government, and to the authorities um, that can help to help us. In a related story, the closure or shutdown of any market has a great impact on not just the traders and shoppers, but also on the economy. Now, these concerns were raised by market participants during a stakeholders meeting discussing the demolition and closure of markets in Lagos. They say, contrary to what is obtained currently, the government can close markets for renewal and modernization while still preserving the significant economic and social roles of the markets with proper planning in place. New Central's Ni Omoni has more details. Lagos has over 1,200 markets that serve as economic hub for millions of residents. The informal sector, including these markets, account for over 65% of employment in Lagos and over 80% in Nigeria as a whole. Many Lagos residents rely on the markets for their livelihoods and shopping needs. These livelihoods is, however, frequently threatened by demolition and mostly closure in the metropolis as part of urban renewal projects of the state. The move has sparked controversy as many argue that the markets play an important role in the Lagos and Nigerian economies. Noting that the Malaysian major markets could have serious repercussions for the economy and the lives of Lagosians, the network of entrepreneur women gathered stakeholders to discuss a way forward. There was a time we even took them through financial literacy and over the years now there has been a remarkable improvements and a lot of them now have more understanding on how to run their markets. Now they are doing, they are building capacity. All of a sudden, their marketplaces are being demolished. You know, it's a good thing. You know, if you want growth and development, you have to do these things. But we must always put a human face to the things that we do. The government argues that urban renewal projects alongside sanitation practices are needed to modernize Lagos and improve infrastructure. However, critics say proper consultation with market stakeholders do not 
take place before the demolition plans were announced. Sometimes you, you might have to, to go the way of cane and carrot approach at times. When they are not doing what they are supposed to be done, sanitation wise, sometimes the government might have to like lock up the, these markets. Gone are the days when we protest, we carry leaves to allow sun. We don't do that because we have credible leaders. And we expect the leaders to have good consultation with their members. Carry all your members along so everybody will know what is happening in the, in the market. There have to be a stakeholders engagement. The local government have to deal with those people that are originally in the market before going further. To minimize the negative impact of any market's demolition, experts recommend that the Lagos state government engage in thorough consultations with markets, users and workers, proper impact assessments, transition plans and alternative livelihood support could help make any urban renewal project more inclusive and sustainable for all Lagosians. In Lagos, for the U Central, Ni Omani. Nigeria's House of Representatives has approved President Bola Chinumbu's request to extend the implementation of the capital component of the 2023 budget from June to December 2024. This followed a letter transmitted from the President to the House, which was read on the floor of the House by the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Idong Joseph reports. Shortly after the commencement of plenary, the bills to extend the capital component of the 2023 budget and the supplementary budget till December the 31st, 2024, was introduced by the majority leader of the House. He describes the move as a way to ensure the completion of all ongoing capital projects. That essentially the date be adjusted from 30th June 2024 to 31st December 2024. This marks the third time the implementation of the two bills has been extended by the parliaments. It was first extended to March the 31st, 2024, and later extended to the 30th of June, 2024. During the debate on the general principles of the bill, several lawmakers expressed a diverse view, with some of them arguing that while it is legal to extend the capital components of the budgets, it is wrong to have multiple budgets at the same time. We will not just criticize, but provide an alternative, sir. And therefore, I will suggest that the House leader steps down this bill, and then we go back to the drawing board, look at it, all the projects that are contained in 2023, budget and 2023 supplementary budget. We take them over to the 2024 supplementary budget. We must unite ourselves and we must stand collectively and send a signal to the government of the Federation that not, not everything could fly. When you have a budget being extended continuously, continuously, it means the government is that the government is lagging behind in the pursuance of the implementation of that bill. In response, the House dissolved into an executive session to deliberate further on the matter. The Speaker of the House appealed to members to allow the passage of the budget extension. And in so doing, we have approved clauses 1 and 2, clause 3 as amended, explanatory memorandum and the long title of the bill. Lawmakers say the passage of the bill proved the Parliament's unwavering commitments to ensure that projects outlined in the budget are completed for the good of citizens. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. President Bola Tunubu has approved the National Construction and Household Support Program to boost agricultural productivity and provide economic relief to Nigerians. The program includes the rollout of several road and rail infrastructure projects, including the Sokoto Badagri Highway and the Lagos Calabar Coastal Highway. The president has also approved funding for the Port Harcourt Maiduguri Railway and the Ibadan Abuja segment of the Lagos Kano Standard Gauge Railway. Additionally, the program includes allocations for bus procurement of lift grants for families and food distribution across the nation. Speaking at the National Economic and Council meeting, President Tunubu urged governors to work together to meet needs of citizens, emphasizing the importance of boosting food production and providing relief 
to Nigerians. Now, watching news now on New Central TV, we go on a show break. When we come back, there's more, and this time from Kogi State. Stay with us. Hey, welcome back. Protesters from the Concerned Kogi Citizens Forum have gathered in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, to protest alleged electoral malpractice in the recent Kogi state governorship election. The group claims the election failed to meet, standard, to meet stipulated standards of transparency and fairness, saying widespread fraud was witnessed during the use of the bimodal voters accreditation system. New Central's Joshua Imarai tells us more. These protesters are members of the concerned Kogi Citizens Forum. Dissatisfied with the conduct of the last governorship election in the state, they are accusing Nigeria's independent National Electoral Commission of using its beaver's machine to perpetrate fraud during the poll. What we are out here to say is that the taxpayers' money that has been spent heavily to bring about the bill should not go under the carpet because the bill is pro-Nigeria. The bill is pro-people. But whatever is happening now is, is against the wishes of the Nigerians. It is against the wishes of the people. Professor Mahmoud, if you know professors from universities cannot conduct a credible election for you to maintain your name, as I like Chairman, please give us mechanics. Dr. Mahmoud and his team came to Kogi State before the election in Kogi State, 11-11. Yes. Yes. He told Kogi State that Bibas will give us a credible election. But very unfortunate, the election that was conducted was not abide by Bibas' rule. And another problem we are facing in this country to be shot and cool, to be shot and cool against democracy must talk. Yes. To be shot and cool against democracy must talk. Yes. The protesters are also calling on the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission to guarantee the proper deployment and use of Beaver's machine in the upcoming off cycle elections in Ondo and Edo states. They say this is essential to ensure transparency and accountability in the electoral process. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarai. In the meantime, a group known as the Election Transparency Advocacy Coalition in Kogi State, Nigeria, has issued a stern warning to disgruntled politicians who lost the 2023 governorship election. According to the coalition, these politicians have been promoting an atrocious ethnic agenda in this state and haven't been sponsoring a campaign of calumny against the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, for doing its constitutional duty. The group, led by joint coordinators Barrister Oluchi Anabode and Barrister Peter Ngwoke, condemned these politicians, particularly those advocating for Igala domination of the state, and urged them to desist from their divisive actions. In a statement, the coalition emphasized that Kogi State belongs to all its indigents and not to any particular tribe. They, they commended INEC for organizing a credible governorship poll and urged politicians to accept the outcome of the election and work towards the development of the state. And so joining us on the news is Isaiah Davis Ijele. He's a convener of Consent Kogi Citizens. Isaiah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're pressed for time, so let's get started. Uh, I want to ask first, why are the residents of Kogi State uh, protesting in Abuja despite the election tribunal having issued its final verdicts? Um, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. And I want to say this, that the, f the judgment of the tribunal is a miscarriage of judgment. That is not the judgment. In fact, they contradicted their own judgment. And may I tell you this, that even the so-called APC that they gave judgment in their favor, say to quote, also cross appeal the judgment. That is to tell you that there is a fundamental issues that they refuse to address. The issue of beavers can never succumb to any technicalities. It is like you changing your identity or somebody denying you of your identity or of who you are. The, the function of beavers according to INEC is for accreditation. 
Professor Mahmoud said it in a Chatham house in London that Beavers has come to stay. I'm glad you're mentioning and the Beavers. I'm glad you're mentioning it because I want to be. I want you to be specific, right? Be specific on the allegations of fraud involving the yes. Beavers, right? That protesters are making. I want you to be very specific. Please go ahead. Yeah. Now, Professor Mahmoud meant to say this, and you know that gave everybody hope. All the Nigerian youth came out massively. You are a journalist. Do your finding. Almost 80 percent of the Nigerian youth are PVC owners for 2023 general election because of the hope that now we have the authority and power, power to the people, to elect our own. But unfortunately, in, in, the, in the presidential election, it is even a bit fair. It is the, the problem of the presidential election was non-transmission of uh, the, the results from the polling unit. But as for Kogi election, it is a pure scam and fraud. Where you have accreditation in a polling unit, 200, and the total vote of that polling unit is 2,000. Accreditation, 100. Total number of, of, of vote cast at the same polling unit, 1,000. How, how, who manufactured the difference? Now, let me, let me tell you this categorically and to be specific. Professor Johnson Uraba from UNN is the returning officer for Kogi State, a professor. Him being a professor, when he was to tally all the results from each local government to call for final result, he never exceeded the total number of accreditation according to him. Did he really find out if those accreditation he called are really at the accreditation as recorded in the papers from those polling units? If he do not exceed the accreditation from those polling units, from Kogi State as a general uh, accredited voters, how then will he exceed the calling extra or over voting of each polling unit? That is a fraud. We have all these things tender before the tribunal. The tribunal adopted all evidences we presented. Now let me take, shock you. The person that came as an INEC, that is the PW1, is an INEC officer, is an INEC staff, is an INEC engineer, expert that was sent, summoned by the court to produce their representative to demonstrate the beavers. Right. We now, ventilated each of the polling units in court. As I, 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 I hate to cut you because we're, I hate to cut you because we're pressed for time, right? Uh, one of the accusations you just made now is electoral malpractice, right? So, how is the Election uh, Transparency Advocacy Coalition responding to the to accu these accusations, especially of electoral mal malpractice in the Kogi State governorship polls? How you even give such people a, a, a forum to talk to us, or even to, I, I am I'm disappointed that you can even mention such people's name, one pro, uh, barista, and okay, and one bar, uh, barista, all this, these are evil names, these are people from the east, these are people that are looking for what to eat. Yeah, but are they, Kogi State, no, are they feeling our pains? Yeah, but are they not Nigerians? If anybody who's, if, are they not Nigerians? So are you saying that because they are not indigenous no, of the state or from Togi State? The polling unit. We are talking of people speaking from the polling unit. We are talking of the result on island. Because you just mentioned because you just mentioned tribe. So I need to be con I need to ask a question. Does that tribe disqualify them from talking about the elections and saying that it was fair? If, how can they call the election fair? Because I want to know why it's a polling unit. Let them tell us who they are calling you. If so this Kogi isn't about tribe. Saying that the election, we are talking with evidence. Let them bring the evidence why the election is transparent. Let them give us the evidence. Why? How do they know that the election is transparent? We are the polling unit with evidence telling you that accreditation is 200 in polling unit A and the total number of vote cards is 2,000. If they have anything contrary to that, they should bring it. We're now, not talking about technicality. We're not talking about any uh, 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 stories or no story from nowhere. We are not talking about talk and bush stories. We are talking about reality as I, at the, uh, on the Vivas. Vivas was displayed at the court as in I, the same 
As I, yes. you, you just mentioned, uh, you were saying the recommendations that they made. I want you to be clear. What actions are, are being recommended by this, uh, by this group, which is the Election Transparency Advocacy Coalition, to promote unity and, uh, and development in, in Kogi State? Because they said, let's move <coughs> past this. It's clear. But I need you to be certain. What actions are they, being, are they recommending? My group, or the, uh, no, that's the so-called uh, transparent. What the, are they, the they're, transparency. They're only what they are saying. My yes. group. No, the the election uh, transparency advocacy coalition. They could not recommend anything. All they are telling us, Nigeria, that everything is now okay. That INEC have come to stay. Don't defraud. Uh, don't uh, blackmail INEC. Shame on them. So, what is your Shame group recommending? You see. Eh? And what, what is your group recommending? As concerned Kogi citizens. Instantly, I see my dear professors have failed Nigeria. INEC have been, INEC is not just a building, and INEC is not a paper. There are people saddled with the responsibility of giving us a free and fair election. The returning officers that 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 are assigned by INEC to each state could not conduct a credible election. And many Nigerians are complaining. You see what is happening in Kenya? It will be a child play if INEC continue to manipulate this system. And we are calling on Nigerians and on the House of Assembly, the Senate, the majority leaders, and the, 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 the uh, upper and lower chamber to enforce the rule of law, to enforce the accreditation process that was brought into Nigeria electoral system to give us hope so that we can trust the system all over again. Otherwise, Edo will be a child play. Listening to this, Edo people reject professor. It is better they bring up a Babala one from Okija shrine and swear by the oath of his of his shrine that if you read the election, it should not go back home safely. It is better they give us Ogun worshippers. It is better they give us Obatala worshippers. As a, it is better they train a mechanic on the roadside, train a, a, a taxi driver a, to be a returning officer instead of professors. As professors have failed us. A professor that will come up plus one twenty is not a professor. As a, to say this. We need to change that institution. They don't have the monopoly to be only the one to, to, to represent and be the returning officer. Let's. Isaiah, I have to let you go. We're running out of time, but thank you so much for coming on. Isaiah Ijile there, he is uh, uh, the convener of Concerned Kogi Citizens. Many thanks for doing this with us. We switch gears now to the east of Nigeria, where the workers of the Abba, uh, Abia State House of Assembly, under the ages of the Parliamentary uh, Staff Association of Nigeria, say they look forward to a time when the legislature in the state will attain full autonomy. Chairman of the body in Abia State, Mr. Sonde Kalu, says it's been a long walk to independence for the law-making arm of the government following non-implementation of the act granting it autonomy by the previous government. New Centrist Chinwe Ugeli reports. In 2019, the then governor of Abia State, Dr. Kezi Bazo, assented to the bill granting autonomy to the Abia State House of Assembly, but never implemented it. That law was signed in 2019, and we celebrated and uh, thank God for signing the law. Then, when it goes to implementation, go and that law. As a member of the system assembly, we made this law. We fought it. We did everything that we could to ensure that it is signed and it is implemented. The governor can sign as much bills as possible, but if none of them is implemented, it took nearly 20 years of agitation by the parliamentary workers in Abia State for this necessity to be partly achieved. It gives the administrative autonomy of the legislature in Abia State. The, the, the administration of the House will be able to hire and fire, administer their workers, set up pension board for them and all of Governor Alex Oti recently appointed seven persons as members of the House of Assembly Commission who have been successfully screened by the legislators now awaiting inauguration. Whilst the workers may celebrate this administrative autonomy, there still is the outstanding financial autonomy which grants the Assembly the most important freedom it needs to operate and be like other states in the zone. The House of Assembly Service Commission and 
and also the very first step towards actualization of independence of the legislature is not going to be an easy thing because um, that would mean all the financial things, everything that is due to the legislature will be given to them directly. And still believing that uh, the financial aspect of it and uh, our consolidated incentive salary structure will take its shape. The 21-day ultimatum issued on the 14th day of June 2024 by the legislative staff may have informed the decision of the governor to make the appointments whilst promising full implementation of the law. In Omaha for News Central, Shinwe Ugele. In watching news now on New Central TV. After the break, there's news, but from across the borders. Stay with us. Hey, welcome back. The mission of the SADC Panel of Elders Oversight Committee and Lusoto's forums have begun their consultations with key stakeholders. The delegation, which is led by the former president of Tanzania and also the chairman of the Panel of Elders, came to Lusoto with the aim to get information on the reform's progress. Now, they said that this is their first mission in Lusoto and is intended to find information about the comprehensive implementation of reforms report from political leaders, civil society organizations, and everyone involved, including His Majesty King Lishi uh, III and the Prime Minister. According to the report, or according to report released by the African Risk Capacity Group, documents that 1,436 disaster events happened in 29 African countries between 2000 and 2023. Floods accounted for 66% of these incidents, followed by storms at 15.4% and droughts at 11.7%. African governments spent an estimated $2.2 billion managing weather-related disasters in 2023 alone. The report further states that 40% of Africa is currently covered by early warning systems. Now, this calls for African countries to allocate funds for disaster management. And now joining us on the news is Tambili Nkunjana. He's a senior agricultural economist at the National Agricultural Marketing Council. And he joins us live today to discuss uh, issues. Tumbali, thank you so much for coming. And let's get started. I would like for you to you know, explain the current trend of increasing natural disasters in Africa and its relation to climate change. Okay, thanks for, for having me and, and, and your viewers. Uh, so the, there has been an issue, I mean, with Africa recently, as much as it is generally a global issue, but uh, we've seen these uh, trends in terms of uh, occurrences uh, across the region in a number of years. For instance, if you are to look or uh, to compare uh, Africa as a region to the world, you realize that as of last year, uh, data shows that South Africa has is the third, you know, largest number of, of disasters in terms of the rate of frequency that has been happening after Asia and, and Americas. And this is, of course, uh, is, I think it's seconded by the number of disasters that we have seen recently. You'll recall we have had quite a number of cyclones to a number of countries from Africa, including Madagascar and Mozambique. Now we are currently experiencing a drought. So this is something that is calling you know, for, for some significant measures in terms of trying to be able to address the climate change you know, uh, at least uh, in its entirety, and of course, uh, and the issues that it is bringing uh, currently to the African uh, continent, as we have seen, and as of this year, that that has has uh, caused a significant, you know, issues in terms of the production of food in general. Hmm. Uh, now, I have to ask, right, does Africa's uh, geography and, and climate make it more vulnerable to, to natural disasters? Um, yeah, so because, I mean, uh, the, the reality is that climate is affecting the entire world, as I said earlier on, but based on the measures and, of course, the, the, the topographies and, the, you know, the terrains of each region will have, uh, these are going to be affecting, you know, uh, those areas differently. For instance, if you are to look into the semi-arid or arid areas, you find that uh, the drought uh, has been going on. For instance, if you are to look specifically the Horn of Africa, the countries like towards Kenya, Ethiopia, and so forth, you realize that 
for, for the recent years, there have been consecutive years where we have seen quite a number of drought that has persisted for quite longer periods that it normally did before. And this is something that has to do with, you know, the climate change has been said a number of times. And mm -hmm. also for the countries that have, you know, that are sort of more like tropically, we have seen quite a devastating in terms of an effect of occurrences in terms of the cyclones and the, the, the storms. So basically based on the, you know, the, the, the natural uh, surroundings of those areas, the, the climate change is exacerbating all the problems that are related to those specific areas based on the, you know, on the, the, the region is, you know, natural um, standing in terms of be it is a dry, is a semi-arid area or is it tropical and so forth. So this, of course, it is showing across the, the African continent based on what the examples that I just made earlier on. Right. Now, of course, you we're going to bring agriculture into this and, and food security into this, right? Because I, I think that uh, basically that's one of the reasons why you're here, if not the only reason. So the implication of, of, of climate change like and the, and, how, and the relation of climate change and this natural disasters that we're seeing in Africa, increasing natural disasters we're seeing in Africa, how is it affecting food security and its availability and even agricultural production altogether? Yeah, no, for, for, for Africa, that one is always going to be an issue. I mean, we, we a lot of analysts, you know, have always raised an issue in terms of how Africa needs to be ready. For instance, if we are to pull in general, is that Africa remains a country that is a net importer of food. And this has been an issue for some time, even before the current El Ninos that you are experiencing now, it has always been in a net importer of products. So given the current situation, that is the, the excessive you know, uh, climate-related problems, not necessarily in Africa, but across the world, is that now the, the issue of food production in general is becoming a problem. For instance, if I may put the, the example of this year, we have such a situation in South Africa, which is a key producer, producer of white maize and a supplier to the Southern African region. We have realized that at least there's going to be a decline of around 20% uh, of white maize production. And this has simply uh, very important implications, you know, for those countries that buy uh, this maize uh, from South Africa, and of course the products that are milled from uh, from that particular maize. And of course, if you are also to bring in the issue of Asia, which I said that is one of the, of the regions globally that has been negatively impacted, and is actually amongst the, the the regions in the in the world that has been seeing devastation in this. It is quite an important uh, region where a lot of rice is produced. I remember uh, Africa is one of the highest consumers of rice uh, and it buys that it buys that upside. So in terms of food availability elsewhere, and then of course the amount that we can be able to produce, as I was making an example this year, I remember for instance, uh, I think Zambia declared a state of disaster because of drought, as uh, Zimbabwe did the same thing, I believe Malawi as well. So there has been a number of these issues that of course they have quite a direct impact in terms of how the continent can be able to produce its own food, mm. given that it already has a deficit in terms of producing food. As a result, the monies that are available now, they need to be channeled in terms of other means to make sure that we are, you know, the, 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 the governance is making sure that a lot right. of people are to be supported. Ten billion. Because Ten billion. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry I have to quote you there, but many thanks for coming on because we're pressed for time and we have other guests. But I appreciate you for doing it, with, doing this with us. And that's Tambile Nkunjana. He is a senior agricultural economist at National Agricultural Marketing Council and was talking to me about the increasing African disaster, uh, climate change, and its correlation with food access and, you know, and security. Again, many thanks, Tambile. We appreciate you for doing this with us. And we'll move thanks. now to... We move now to Burundi, where its Supreme Court has upheld the life sentence handed down to the country's former Prime Minister, uh, General Buyoni. Buyoni was Prime Minister from mid-2020 until September 2022, when he was fired, days after the President had warned of an alleged coup plot against him. He was sentenced in December to life in prison on a raft of charges including using witchcraft to threaten the president's life, destabilizing the economy and illegal enrichment. The former prime minister may still appeal to the Supreme Court, uh, said a legal expert who also requested anonymity.
And now to the debate from last night, a halting uh, Joe Biden struggle to lay concerns. He is too old, old for a second term in the White House in a fiery debate with Donald Trump marked by personal insults. Trump lashed out at his successor, calling him a failure on the economy and the world stage. Biden looked to hit back, but his delivery was faltering as he spoke rapidly in a raspy trilling of voice, stumbled on his words and stared open-mouthed. His performance after he spent the week secluded in preparation sparked new concern within his Democratic Party as polls show Trump is tied or ahead for the November election. It was the first debate ever between a president and former president, and each accused the other of being history's worst. Still on the debate, U.S. Pres politicians have uh, com commented on Thursday's U.S. presidential debate, which carried huge stakes for both Joe Biden and Donald Trump as they battle for an advantage in their tight race for the White House. Nowadays, because he is under such a vast criminal cloud, he is obsessed with himself. He's not simply running for the White House, he's running from the jailhouse. But do so you that's think his problem. But if somebody at home is asking themselves, who's going to make me proud of being an American again? That's where Trump won this hands down. He mopped the floor. I thought it was a great outcome. So joining us on the news to you know, share his thoughts is Collins Nweke. He's a global affairs analyst. Collins, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate you for doing this with you, with this. I mean, I, I got to ask, right? How do you think President Biden's performance in the debate will impact his campaign, especially considering the concerns about his age? Well, uh, thank you for having me. At um, the backdrop of uh, the debate uh, was always uh, his age. Uh, that had always been uh, an issue. Now, if you look at the fact that um, historically, uh, incumbent presidents uh, in uh, a debate of this nature usually score uh, lower than uh, their challenger, you will see that ordinarily, um, you know, they wouldn't have been very much to, uh, you know, worry about. Obama was there. Obama performed so badly, so poorly uh, during the first uh, debate. I can go on and on and on. But the point is that uh, even before the debate, there was already that big question mark hanging over, um, you know, uh, Biden's uh, ability to be the president considering uh, his age. And yes, indeed. I mean, not even his uh, Democratic, um, you know, uh, colleagues uh, could deny the fact that uh, his performance was very, very abysmal. It was very, very poor. Mm -hmm. Now, they are trying to still manage, uh, you know, the aftermath by actually saying that uh, he made a, a poor start, but he finished uh, strongly. Well, uh, it remains to be seen how his performance is going to uh, you know, affect his chances of Indeed. being uh, re-elected. Speaking of uh, performance, right, when you look at the debate, there were lots of personal jabs going on there. You know, everyone was, you know, taking jabs at each other, Trump and Biden. But what are the potential implications of, of Trump's attacks on Biden regarding economic and international failures for Biden's support base? Well, um, there's something curious that uh, has been happening, uh, you know, since uh, the debate, and that is the fact that, um, you know, when polls uh, were taken, it doesn't look like uh, there is a significant shift in terms of, um, you know, people who were supporting Biden, no longer supporting him because they felt he performed, um, you know, poorly, uh, and the other way around, uh, the same for, um, you know, for uh, uh, Trump. So. As a matter of fact, uh, it does look like uh, the debate isn't having, uh, you know, very much um, uh, significant impact on what is going to uh, happen. I think um, the point uh, remains that uh, they still have a long way to go, uh, some four months, and I believe that uh, there is ample opportunity for, um, you know, both sides to begin to uh, reinvent themselves and, uh, you know, actually uh, convince the American people that they are the one, uh, you know, one of them is the one fit for the job. But ultimately, America is faced with a choice between a common convicted uh, criminal, uh, which is what Donald Trump is, and uh, a 
an old man that is um, fumbling very low in energy and appears not to have um, you know the strength required to do the job. Those right. are the choices facing the American people. And, 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 and I'm so glad you captured it very well, because in this side of the world, we're seeing that finally, for the very first time, uh, America is faced with what a, a number of countries in this part of the continent face as well, which is either the devil or the deep blue sea, or the, you know, the blue, deep, deep blue sea. And so in this case, right, I, I have to ask, how would Biden's debate performance influence uh, the Democratic Party's strategy? Because uh, you were talking about this earlier, so I would like to circle back to that. Now, as the polls show there's a tight race with, with Trump now, how can they take it, tip it all the way to the top that Biden has somewhat of an advantage? Well, Biden, uh, just like Trump, uh, needs to uh, reinvent himself. Uh, the performance was poor, abysmally poor, now, um, in the second debate coming up, I believe, on the 10th of uh, September, and in the run-up uh, to that uh, second debate, uh, if he's able to show that, um, you know, what his, uh, you know, handlers are saying is correct, which is that uh, he had, uh, you know, the common cold, uh, he's been under the weather, and that was uh, what actually affected his uh, performance, uh, if uh, he's able to prove true being a lot more articulate, show high rather than uh, low energy, I believe that Americans uh, are going to give him uh, a second chance. Now, for Trump, I think it's um, a much more harder ball uh, to play here because um, his conviction is his conviction. Americans uh, you know, know all the truth about him, yet his support base remains strong. I think the challenge now for Trump is how is he going to, uh, you know, uh, convince the independents and undecided uh, people? He's not doing a very good job at it. He appears to be, um, you know, playing to the gallery of his uh, strong uh, support right base. Right-winged people. How long, how, for how long that will, um, you know, hold him through to the finishing line remains. Um, you know, to be seen. Well, Collins, uh, we want to say thank you very much for coming on, and uh, we'll continue to put our eyes on the presidential elections there uh, come November, and even the next debate. Again, many thanks. And that's uh, Collins Nwiki. He is a global uh, affairs analyst, and he joins me today to talk about the U.S. presidential uh, debates. And let's uh, bring you sports news, shall we? <laughs> Darwin uh, Nunes scored in his seventh consecutive match for Uruguay as they beat Bolivia 5-0 in the Copa America. The Liverpool striker netted the second goal of the victory that leaves Uruguay on the brink of qualification for the quarterfinals. Uruguay sits top of Group C with a 100% record and would advance to the last eight by avoiding defeat to the USA. A defeat in that tie will likely see them go through due to a superior goal difference. Tim Wai is the son of uh, Africa football legend, and that's George Wei, and former Arsenal Nigerian striker for Larry Balogun, and other members of the U.S. national team were racially abused on social media after the Americans were bitten 2-1 by Panama in the Copa America. The U.S. Soccer Federation issued a statement saying it was deeply disturbed with the racist comments made online. Wei was sent off in the 18th minute after punching a Panama player. It was the earliest red card for a U.S. player since Jimmy Corred in 2010 in a friendly game against Honduras. Now, after scoring USA's only goal on Thursday, Balogun shared racist messages he received on Instagram, which included images of primates and emoji of bananas. And that's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories. Nigerians lose millions as many shops burnt with unquantifiable goods destroyed. Africa faces rising natural disasters as El Nino threatens. And we also told you that court upholds life sentence for Burundi XPM Buyoni. Now remember that you can send us your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number now showing on the screen. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can also watch New Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Judith TV. Bye for now.